two cases I'll be presenting, and uh -huh. then I'll focus more on the technical aspects. So with okay. that, I start, and uh, this is uh, just. Uh, Now, why the slides are not moving? Hello, Gaurav. Yeah, sir. Sir, एक बार slide आप change करके देखिए sir. अच्छा. Okay, can you see yeah. now? Yes, yes, sir, yes. Sir. Okay. okay so friends last two decades have seen a lot of turbulence as far as surgical management of bph is concerned and uh, we all know that urp is the gold standard for surgical bph treatment but what has changed in last uh, two decades is that the longevity of these patients have increased because as the longevity has increased the comorbidities have also increased and the number of patients on anticoagulants have increased not only this the medical management has also revolutionized the surgical therapy because the surgery is now getting delayed and so much delayed that patients don't the, the earlier indication used to be the recurrent retentions recurrent hematurias but with medical management we don't see the absolute indications they are presenting late and what has happened in this uh, is that multiple available alternatives of surgical therapy have made this morbidity of turp in complicated bph because in a standard bph you all know the uh, morbidity is less but uh, in complicated bph whether it is large prostate infected prostate and all the it is unacceptable and uh, when laser uh, started i started in year 99 2000 the adoption was with lot of skepticism but with it is now rising and uh, it is perceived to be minimally invasive simple and safe by community at large patients are crossing regional borders to gain access to technology and expertise and uh, even in uh, all over the world the number of procedures are rising urologists are offering and patients are accepting more surgery after technology adoption because of minimal morbidity now this is one patient 65 year old on catheter for acute urinary retention and his ultrasound showed 133 grams prostate normal renal parameters diabetic hypertensive he has had ptca 3 years and on anticoagulants now he was on medical management for one year and uh, uh, dr uh, uh, taneja what do you like to do for him other things are normal the culture is normal flow is obstructive hello you are the speaker dr vashne go ahead you are the okay. speaker dr vashne so, go ahead ha so these were the options which he had he happened to be father of a cardiologist and this cardiologist said that i would like to do a, a laser ktp laser green light laser for him so he underwent green light laser vaporization complete prostate ablation 2 hours duration intra operative period was uneventful however post operatively uh, he was fine but on second third day his condition deteriorated went into sepsis shock and he was put on inotropes in icu urine was clear now again the options were what should be done whether we do a conservative treatment to stabilize him or do a suprapubic cystostomy we did a suprapubic cystostomy on him patient got stabilized but after 2 weeks a repeat ultrasound done showed 100 g prostate trus suggested at 86 g of prostate no prostatic abscess it was a three grade three gland uh, size on dre however no boggy feeling again the options were whether we give him a trial without catheter and remove spc keep spc for 4 to 6 weeks or do a scopy and proceed and this is what we found on scopy
so this is just i want to say that when i was learning my in my learning phase we this ktp laser was very common green light laser people were doing left and in us even today the green light laser is very very common and if you see this uh, scopy you will see that there are a lot of inflammatory flakes inside and this is all sloughed material but when we come out you will find that this is the kind of apical tissue quite a tremendous uh, the thing the sphincter and these are the two apical lobes practically untouched and both the lateral lobes also virtually untouched so we had the option again that we give a trial without catheter or do any of these and ultimately i thought that i being doing holep so i did holep on him and i to my surprise the planes were very easily found because that capsular plane was practically untouched and uh, uneventful peri and post operative period and this patient voided well and this is to highlight this is the amount of tissue necrotic infected tissue which could be safely uh, morselated and enucleated so friends uh, with this uh, i would not go into the literature because the literature tells that this urosepsis is a very common thing after ktp laser and uh, this residual necrotic prostatic tissue uh, ultimately could be very problematic people have done turp and this is just that i did holep so i thought i must share with you we are getting quite a lot of cases where this is another patient is a 65 year old gentleman diabetic and hypertensive detected as tmt positive deranged lipid profile ultrasound showed 146 g prostate patient is asymptomatic cag underwent ptca he had medicated a stent put on clopidogrel and aspirin which is a very common finding nowadays majority of these patients are uh, have this um, uh, cardiological issues i am surprised uh, cardiologists they never do ultrasound many i have been advocating to cardiologists that uh, they must do at least an ultrasound because patients who come uh, for just uh, heaviness in the chest they are taken for angioplasty with medicated stents and later on after a week 10 days or within 6 months they will they are uh, taken up for uh, this uh, they come with hematuria and clot retention and what not this patient had a lvef of 35% patient got vascular with medical management and uh, then question is how long to be on catheter anticoagulant medication for how long what he, if he bleeds actively and medical management how long catheterize in case of return. so all those things were discussed and this is what we do usually with these patients he was in a on a regular follow up with the local urologist presented to him with hematuria and clots and what usually is done by these people at low uh, places many places that uh, they start uh, scoping and doing fulguration of these bleeding points and what i have seen is that it is not always successful this patient has started bleeding again his hemoglobin kept on falling down and then when i got a call the patient was transferred in ambulance at night we did a clot evacuation more than 500 ml clots evacuated kept on a continuous irrigation with intermittent hematuria stabilized with two units of blood the question comes what next so of course the options again remain whether to post rt embolization whole app bipolar trp diode atp we all know and i am sure that you would all know that such patients are definitely difficult patients and showing these two cases is just to tell you that today it is very important that we all should learn holep this is this uh, these two cases were to highlight that why it is necessary for the urological community that these are the kind of cases we do get and then they at middle of night have to be transferred and uh, this and for shortage of time and uh, this thing i had this another case very difficult case but we will talk, uh, we will not do it we will just highlight that how 
we do uh, the techniques of for holep. So question is that uh, holep is being done now for more than 20 years and you will be surprised that the more the procedure which is com coming up in uh, vogue, the more the techniques are coming up. Initially, classically, Peter Gilling described three lobe technique where he used to remove the median lobe and then he used to take out the two lateral lobes. And then I had popularized this two lobe technique only uh, most of the cases which, is, which I used. And uh, Cape Town I presented in 2006, this two, uh, two lobe technique. And then now our papers are full of N block enucleation of the prostate. But the point is, that why so much changing in techniques the techniques is that initially the stress incontinence factor was disturbing the urologist leading to poor adoption of this procedure and therefore the japanese team started doing anterior posterior dissections claiming that uh, the stress incontinence was less and this i presented in uh, world congress 2012 that holep made simple i am a student of professor rana and who he used to always tell me that Anil, a good surgeon is one who makes a procedure look simple. So I thought that everybody is saying that procedure of OLAP is difficult. Why should we not make it look simple and make should be simple? So this was my effort to simplify the procedure. And you will be surprised that now this procedure of OLAP in my hands is only two steps. One is you develop the floor. The other is you develop the roof. Now, all the, the other teaching which I got from my uh, mentors was that whatever is the dangerous thing should be dealt with in the beginning. Suppose you are afraid of sphincter, you focus on the sphincter. If you are afraid of the ureteric orifices, you cite the ureteric orifices first. If you are afraid of capsule, then you see the capsule and preserve or prevent injury to the capsule. So this is simply... The thing is that we just widen the bladder neck by giving an incision proximal to viru. Then we switch to 12 o'clock proximal to sphincter and then widen the roof. And then you have just two mushrooms sitting at 3 and 9 o'clock, which can be simply removed by clockwise and anti-clockwise this thing. So if you look at it, after having done these two incisions, this is the picture which looks, it is an endoscopic view after defining the distal limit. So you have defined the distal limit, you have developed the floor, you have developed the roof, and then you have just two adenomas sitting at right and left as mushrooms, which can be uh, safely enucleated. Now question is that how to prevent all kinds of injuries. So therefore we must know that what are the possible injuries. The possible, the most dangerous thing is when you are learning and is starting HOLEP, the first thing which you can go wrong is just proximal to viru. If you apply force, you can just perforate and go deep into the uh, posterior capsule, uh, perforate the capsule just at the beginning. And uh, in case the other injury, which is a very dangerous injury, especially in large glands, is that prostates are never uh, round. The ideal learning is a tangerine technique when you just peel off from uh, this thing. But uh, if you are uh, just following the capsule, as I told you that the injury could be at the base or it could be here. The most of the people in large prostates, they just try to pursue at this particular point and they make perforations here or they keep on working here and undermine the trigone. And many a times you can injure these ureteric orifices. So this slide is very important while you are learning that correct plane. And initially, if you mark the bladder neck and mark it here uh, from bladder neck, just one centimeter proximal. So it has to be from proximal to midpoint and from distal to midpoint so that there is no risk of undermining, no risk of injury to the ureteric orifices. So this slide is important. The other thing is where people make a lot of mistakes is that they try to uh, go to the lateral lobe. And in this attempt, they are never going to the right depth. The reason is they are scared of this much tissue, 
which is distal practically 2 cm tissue is distal to the prostate so what happens is that you see the viru and then you are working your way like this so you are leaving lot of adenoma however adenoma goes and therefore one has to work the way of this arrow and then keep on respecting the anatomical nodulations and oscillations and preventing any perforation and the same thing if you have a very large gland if you keep on working here there is a limitation of the scope it won't proceed further so you have to come from above downwards and from top downwards so therefore what has to be done is that you have to precisely respect the anatomy keep the uh, capsule always in focus and don't force and don't give wrong direction to your uh, cap uh, this thing fiber and with this the third important thing which one has to learn in holap is prevention of stress incontinence when i was uh, learning my whole activity was that i have done a good inoculation from here to here i have uh, safe guarded the orifices everything and from then we usually dissect from bladder neck to mid fossa but then whole prostate sits at the sphincter at 12 o'clock and this is to be avoided so i told you that the best uh, thing is that you must know your enemy first better now how to know your uh, danger point first is that you first sight the sphincter here and once you have sighted the sphincter you make a mucosal cut here and detach the adenoma and push it away towards <coughs> mid fossa similarly from viru you have pushed it away to mid fossa and then you are free so you have safeguarded the orifice you have safeguarded the capsule you have safeguarded the sphincter and then you are having the whole adenoma sitting in the center on two sides or one side if in it you want to do an n block and all your anatomical points are nicely safeguarded so with this i would like to show you that this is a large prostate where a uh, patient is on anticoagulants and uh, if you see uh, that uh, first thing is the anatomical evaluation of the adenoma and once you have seen the um, video you will appreciate that the orifices are very close to the bladder neck so many times i am asked this question that Uh, you can do we have done started learning this uh, enucleation but uh, how to prevent undermining or uh, injury to the trigone i always tell them that ureteric orifices are always at the uh, in the bladder so you when you don't see the uh, this thing you are working on the adenoma there is no reason for uh, injury to the orifice so similarly what we do is the first step is at 6 o'clock you have given a small incision at the 6 o'clock and then you have given a small uh, incision at just proximal to the viru and once you have done that the best thing is that the adenoma you can see what i am doing is i am lifting the adenoma i am seeing the capsule but i am not at all touching the capsule so my fiber is always on towards the uh, adenoma and capsule is always visible so the learning phase is that never most of the beginners they make lot of uh, injury to the capsule because they don't respect that capsule has to be preserved so if you see here you can see the viru and what we have done i am not removing anything i am just developing the floor having developed the floor you see you sight the sphincter now once you have sighted the sphincter then you enter and the once you entered 5 mm proximal to the sphincter now you have seen the adenoma on two sides and once you have given this distal uh, cut at the 12 o'clock position now you are just working right and left and develop the roof so if you see what i was trying to show you by the diagram it is the sphincter and if you see the sphincter here you see the uh, adenoma here on two sides and then you have developed you are developing the roof so having said that now my exercise initially was i was developing the floor now the second exercise is you are developing the roof so practically like a butterfly you are working on the 12 o'clock to say 1 o'clock on the right side or 11 o'clock on the left side and you are developing the roof just right and left right and left now why i am emphasizing that when you do this way 
your anatomical boundings are very nicely known if you do not uh, sort of uh, work this way then what happens is that many a times you lose the plane so if you tend to lose the plane then it becomes very difficult so in whole app it is very important that you have got a good orientation so if you have a very good orientation then you will never lose the plane now you can appreciate that i am working at 12 o'clock now this is what i want to show you can you see this the two lobes and here you have the viru here you have the floor and the roof and this is the mushroom yeah and this this is the apical tissue on the 3 o'clock so having given a mucosal incision on this apical tissue now it is going to work anteriorly and posteriorly clockwise anti clockwise this is the capsule which is from 11 o'clock and then i am coming down to say 3 o'clock so can you see that uh, from 11 uh, right from bladder neck this incision is coming on to 11 o'clock uh, this thing to 12 o'clock and then one now here i am working at nearly 2 o'clock uh, dr sandhu hello yes yes sir yes uh, is the uh, video uh, visible yeah it is visible sir there is little bit of pixelation but we can make out what you trying to tell us okay so you can see the capsule now i am working at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock and lifting the adenoma from below now this work of lifting it up from bladder neck right to the uh, mid fossa and from mid fossa i will be coming back right up to the so this is how the capsule is only sighted adenoma is uh, get adenoma move walks away on its own so this is how the uh, full length of uh, adenoma at 4 o'clock and then we move again so this is viru and this has the, this is now at uh, 3 o'clock attached this mushroom and now we will be working clockwise and anti clockwise and uh, detaching the whole adenoma right up to the bladder neck so this is now at, uh, attachment at bladder neck so this is uh, as i say whole simple is uh, how we are doing it nowadays and the only problems which come is the kind of bleeders so sometimes you do come across bleeders and one should not cut on the bleeder which i always want to highlight is that you have to stay away and uh, defocus your beam and that will give a reduction of the energy and then these bleeders will disappear so now you can see that these bleeders they tend to come again and again and uh, again from from a distance this is an artery and this artery can be easily sealed so the problem as i told you the major problems are perforation bleeding and they are can be dealt with very very safely this is another artery and if you see i'll just uh, stay away from this artery at an angle and just be patient one should not be in a hurry to this uh, the uh, to cut the artery again and again you just stay there and apply or you can reduce the energy defocus the beam and these vessels many a times the large vessels and one has to be really uh, this thing and you are always on the capsule so if you are always on the capsule what happens is that many a times despite your diligent effort you have the sinuses which may get open so one should never worry about them because they are very superficial uh, uh, touches of the laser fiber you just press these sinuses with the adenoma so when you press the sinus with an adenoma and work from the other direction nothing will happen and they will seal on their own and uh, the most important thing is that uh, you what you get because you see the point which i want to highlight is that the adenoma is all enucleated and uh, this uh, this 
tissue which is distal to viru so if this is so much distal to viru so howsoever it may be distal to viru it may be 1 cm it may be 2 Ah, the video has frozen, sir. Actually, I've lost contact with uh, Dr. Washne. Can you see him? Can you hear him? Ah, uh, no, sir. I suppose uh, we'll uh, go on. Uh, yeah, there's some problem with the internet on his end, I believe. So, the time uh, okay, yeah, yeah, we we have some questions <laughs> which are coming on the chat. and uh, one of the questions is that uh, is leaving a roof strip helpful in to decrease the stress incontinence and the other question is any techniques and tips to reduce stress incontinence during holep so these two questions uh, were supposed to be answered by dr anil washne but while we are waiting for him to rejoin i, I suppose sir you can answer them yourself yeah yeah so the the best way is to identify the sphincter right in the beginning as dr anil washne said that you should know your enemy well so if you if you when you are doing a cystoscopy which is the diagnostic procedure just before starting holep you <coughs> one should identify the sphincter one should be very careful to see where the sphincter starts where it ends where is the crista urethralis where is viru montanum and once you have learned to identify the sphincter that is the first step towards saving it the second is of course leaving a strip anteriorly is certainly going to save the sphincter a couple of millimeters proximal to the sphincter if you leave some tissue it doesn't matter because you're going to make a wide funnel anyway the third is that uh, you know it is very important when you are actually dissecting off from the uh, distal most part towards the bladder neck the adenoma tends to pull the sphincter along with it towards the bladder so you may feel that you are cutting on the adenoma but actually that mucosal tag as dr washne showed around 3 o'clock that tag can sometimes contain the sphincter <coughs> you can imagine that it is being pulled it's a circle of sphincter is a circular thing and when the mucosa is being pulled along with the adenoma the part of the sphincter is also being pulled there and that is what you need to understand so that is what i always say when i'm trying to tell how to in ah, hello yes dr washi uh, yes sir we lost now yes sir uh, there was some uh, electricity disturbance ha yes, uh, rajesh uh, ha okay. ji ha ji again yeah yeah come over sir we are waiting for you okay so Yeah. yeah. Any I question? think your video. Uh, yeah. We so, can't see you. Your. Uh, you we'll have to upload your video, sir. Again, I think we can't uh, see your face. Neither the video. No, you have to open up the. You have to open up your video. Uh, no, I'm working I'm, on my laptop. Yeah. Uh, but no, no, uh, my on, on, talk was almost complete. No, no, it is so not that can... video I'm talking about. We're talking about. We can't see you, sir. On my. Oh, the other face. You start your video from the. I'll do that. Okay. From the control. Meanwhile, the discussion was going on. So uh, yeah. till the time sir's video uh, pops up again, what uh, Dr. Taneja has told is absolutely correct. Most of us who have graduated from uh, multi incision technique to end block hole, like what I'm doing now, we find that uh, ultimately it is what uh, the patient does not want to be incontinent, in spite of whatever amount of load we remove. If you remove 80% of the prostate and give him incontinence. he is not going to be very happy about it so as mentioned by dr taneja and as it is also there in all the articles which are being published we must leave a certain amount of gland a little bit you know just proximal to the sphincter while making the incision on the mucosa especially dorsally it has been projected that from say 9 o'clock uh, from 3 o'clock to 9 9 o'clock just proximal to the sphincter say about 6 to 7 mm uh, should be the mucosa cut but the problem which is faced by most people who are trying to graduate on to end block techniques is that you know when you put your scope at the lower viru it is difficult sphincter is not one particular line and when you you know uh, turn your scope up to mark that thing it's a wide area so probably you know that is a thing which has to be learned with experience uh, yes i agree with you dr sandu so what happens is that when you have identified the sphincter and then when you are going in 
then what you can see is that uh, when you have made the uh, incisions at so six o'clock, say the, when you have cleared the median lobe, when I do it, when I'm talking about a typical trilobal technique, because it is very important to master that technique before you go over to a bilobar or a monoblock technique. So when you are making an incision at 12 o'clock and you have to be very careful, you have to keep looking at the veru every time you come proximal, uh, distal from the bladder neck and you identify and make yourself happy with a, with a point which is reasonably out of the prostate and reasonably safer from the sphincter. And that is what you have to mark as a transverse line. It is an inverted U kind of a line that you can mark, which is parallel to the sphincter. So if you are used to identifying the sphincter during the cystoscopy, that is how you will be able to mark a line parallel to the uh, uh, sphincter, two to three millimeter proximal towards the bladder neck and parallel to the sphincter. Once you mark that mucosal line, then you can go deep and go up to the capsule. And once you have detached that part, you should be happy that, okay, you have saved the capsule. You, you, so you have saved the sphincter. Then you can, and before you have done that, I expect that you would have already enucleated the lateral lobe up to say nine o'clock on one side and three o'clock on the other side. So you've already done that. Then only a mucosal strip remains. Now that is where I was coming to that if you are, if you continue just like that, you may just cut through the sphincter because the, by then the adenoma is reasonably free and floating more towards the bladder and is pulling the sphincter inside. And that is what you have to learn and make sure that you don't injure the sphincter there. And the mucosal incisions have to be very proximal, just on the gland rather than being distal on the sphincter. So that is very essential for people to learn. So if you just make an incision on the mucosa at that level, you will see the mucosa and the sphincter retract and the adenoma is exposed. And then you can go in there. Yeah, uh, there is another... Please, Dr. Sood. I mean, one of the important reasons why you have incontinence is because of the loss of the mucosa, sphincteric mucosa rather than the sphincter itself. Because when you are doing the enucleation, you tend to push the adenoma inside. And when you push the adenoma inside, the sphincteric mucosa actually comes forward. And you mistakenly usually incise that mucosa uh, and uh, you injure that mucosa. And when it retracts back into the sphincteric uh, urethra, and then there is no water seal is there. And that's why you have those small drops of urine uh, coming out. So there would be two techniques which I would uh, suggest. Is, is uh, First, you mark out the sphincter before you start the surgery. Once you're doing the in initial incision at the five o'clock and at the seven o'clock uh, position, instead of taking it back all the way to the median <laughs> lobe and on the side of the median lobe, you take it forward and you go around the urethra all the way almost up to 12 o'clock. It's called, you just uh, make a circumferential incision over there. You weaken the mucosa so that when you are enucleating, if, when you pull the mucosa, it actually tears at that point rather than pulling the mucosa from the... Uh, uh, from the urethral, uh, from the sphincteric urethra. The the second thing is, uh, you can also make a lambda incision. A lambda incision is you have a twelve o'clock incision, and then it sort of divides into two portions. What Doctor uh, Taneja was saying is the reverse U <laughs> or something. It is along the contour of the adenoma. It's along the contour of the adenoma. Uh, when you bring the incision from five o'clock and you curl all the way around, up, then you meet this incision uh, anteriorly. And uh, what Doctor Sandhu was saying was quite correct. The final strip of mucosa between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, you divide the mucosa on the adenoma. Don't cut it on the roof of the uh, roof of the urethra. You divide it on the adenoma with the laser. And uh, there's no need to leave. Usually it doesn't happen that you leave a bit of the adenoma. If you are particular at that particular point, the whole mucosa, the adenoma will enucleate uh, itself quite easily at that point. Yeah, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, so sir, I yes, have some more questions here. Yeah. So okay. one of the questions is that, for new learners of this art of follow-up, can you start at 50 or 60 watts holding a machine? Okay, Dr. Vashne, so welcome back. So we were discussing some questions that we got from the audience. So this question is, can we start with 50 to 60 watts holding a machine? Yeah, so before you answer that question, uh, I would like to know from you, Dr. Vashne, sir, what are your laser settings, you know, in various parts, uh, various steps, so that we can uh, then move on to that question. Yeah, I think uh, this is very, very important that uh, it is just, I always say, like learning to drive a car. 
nobody learns a car at 200 so the speed of learning has to be commensurate with your understanding of the equipment and the machinery so if you are a learner don't you don't learn at 200 or 100 you learn at 30 40 50 you have to find out how you train yourself to give the efficient results so therefore this question automatically becomes uh, out that uh, 50 watt machine or 60 watt machine i was uh, demonstrating it at a conference in pune 2004 and i was given a case with 30 watt laser origa 30 watt and in the other ot we had uh, professor gupta operating with 100 watt laser and uh, we could finish by the same time the two prostates so what i am trying to say is it is not the energy it is the technique of learning or the art of doing the enucleation yeah i so agree therefore with it you. is to be learned yeah i agree with you dr master because you have to just be in that plane to detach the adenoma from the capsule so yeah. detach the adenoma from the capsule does not need a very high energy always you you very can true. it is only about the speed you may take little more time but energy so i have another question which is better holap or thulap dr you see the anatomical uh, we all are surgeons and we are trained in anatomy and i have always been a passionate um, uh, this thing of uh, anatomy that you must see the anatomy what you are doing it has to be bloodless and it has to be anatomical so whenever you do thulap you have lot of charred tissue you presume that you are at the capsule and you try to justify yourself that yes i can see the capsule here i can see the capsule there and there are islands of tissue which are seen here and there and where they are charred so this is enucleation to your satisfaction but to patient satisfaction to science satisfaction and to completeness of the whole procedure is basically holap so holap is to is an art it has to be mastered and one has to do a complete job which is only possible with holmium so i will add on to this what you rightly mentioned when you are using any other energy to do something like enucleation you end up actually carving because you are not working in the natural plane because those energies are very sharp, they, they are very they have a depth of penetration much more than holmium and they can just destroy the tissue so if you want to preserve the anatomy only then can you dissect in the same plane because if you destroy the plane you are going you are bound to leave behind the islands of tissue and the whole idea of enucleation is not to leave behind any islands of tissue because they are infected they are ischemic infected pro, uh, prostatic tissue which remain the source of dysuria remain the source of infection post operatively so so virtually there is no dysuria after holap if you done a good holap there is no dysuria very minimal but if you see what is pvp what does thulap do they leave behind some charge a charge and ischemic tissue and that ischemic tissue is the cause of dysuria and infection and as you rightly mentioned in your first case when somebody did a pvp i wanted to make a comment that pvp is photo selective vaporization of the prostate so what happens when there is a photo selective vaporization there is a green light which uh, used which is used to to burn or uh, to burn the bleeder or the blood because it is absorbed selectively by the red color in the hemoglobin so initially the mucosa is pink or red and it absorbs the green line and gets vaporized later on the tissue is white so that cannot get vaporized that gets uh, that gets charred or that gets coagulated so the person tries to increase the energy because he still finds the white tissue there and he keeps on coagulating it and that coagulated tissue stays behind as you have very nicely shown in your video so that coagulated tissue is actually a seat of infection because antibiotics can't reach because it is ischemic it is a dead tissue lying there it is like a gangrenous tissue of the prostate left behind to to be a source of sepsis and infection so pvp 
has that disadvantage so one has to it is it has to be used judiciously not in a 130 grams prostate yes in smaller prostates it is certainly uh, uh, sometimes it's a very good technique a very good technology yes as far as tulium laser tulium laser was concerned sir there was yeah. it is being uh, proved that uh, they are trying to say that that's an advantage now in case you lose the planes you can make new planes and come out but actually that is a disadvantage in non atomical way of working so that so is carving tulip, that is what i mean carving yes uh, the tulip is more of a n block resection of the prostate it's not a entirely a enucleation it's carving i call it carving you can carve the prostate it's not an i don't think they follow the principles of enucleation i think the That's only right. technique which comes uh, quite close to the holmium enucleation is the bipolar enucleation i have seen some of the surgeons doing a great bipolar enucleation but uh, i don't think tulip comes close to a holmium enucleation but so sir the fact also remains, remains that uh, there are lot of new technologies in the market and the newer surgeons uh, are not sticking on to holep they are moving on to thulium or to green light of course as already mentioned so what could be the reason that uh, you know we are not able to assimilate the people is it the cost of the machine versus the fiber versus the overall cost of the incontinence you know you can leave behind considerable amount of tissue and still the patient will avoid so what is the reason that we are not able to hold on the you know the fold of the holep dr vasne sir what is your opinion so new technology the people are drifting away no i think a uh, very good question but the thing is that uh, we have uh, not been able to mentor most of the urologists uh, to learn holep in the right perspective what happens is that to adopt a procedure world wide all over means that this procedure has to be mentored properly the drawback which happened with holep was that the teaching institutions of india or perhaps all over the world didn't take up the procedure and the residents were not trained in the procedure the way we train our residents in tur so it has okay. to be a nation wide or world wide approach where the resident from day one is mentored so i always say that holep is a procedure which has to be mentored today if you have to do a radical nephrectomy you cannot do a good job until and unless you are mentored properly so the challenge with this what i am why i am saying this is that i have seen many patients and many urologists in workshops today not doing a good job with holep so what happens is that they will translate these results and call it a bad holep or such a patient goes to another surgeon will say that it is a bad holep or holep gets a bad name so the answer lies in uh, wider uh, teaching institutions taking up the this with this we started indian school of urology started training people uh, with this uh, holep technique somehow the luminous people could not sustain it but i think in life, times to come we are going to have more rajesh is uh, very well aware that how we were uh, struggling to train people so this is what is required so i have one more question it says what should be an ideal case for holep for beginners so dr vasne please well i think this is very well uh, highlighted that a 40 to 60 gram prostate and um, with a good median lobe is the best thing for a beginner because uh, a beginner would make very less mistakes so initially we always used to tell them that if you are uh, learning you simply remove the median lobe and then i will join you so this is how i have trained a lot of people in the beginning and if it is a 40 gram then even lateral lobe one can proceed so median lobe small median lobe or a large median lobe you can start okay there so is there a question are... sir regarding the learning curve dr tanija sir would you like to address that question uh, see the learning curve yes there is a learning curve in all the things that we do so i would say that before you go on to a uh, holep you should be well versed with anatomy you should have done turps almost 100 turp is the minimum that i will recommend and the reason is that you should be used to used to be using those instruments used to be they being there used to be handling the bleeding from the prostate and all the things because 
you know when it once it starts bleeding it can really cause frustration and the because it bleeds on the face of the surgeon so it is very important to do the first step first first step is to master trp the second step is to improvise trp and that is going to the whole lab so when you start doing whole lab it is very important that you should be committed to the technology so how i learned was different means i kept my trp instrument into the the matron's cupboard and said when i require it you give it me and then she would put it inside and it would take it and by then i would have i would have gone over the hump when whatever it was when i'm doing a hole it is important that the first 10 cases be mentored you see the videos nowadays videos are available again and again and then you you should have a mentor in your operation theater you should start doing that and they and look at the dif- difficult situations where that somebody is standing next to you and that is very important and once that happens i'm sure it is not as difficult it is only about a commitment it is a fear that okay whether i will be able to do it or not and as dr vashnik rightly mentioned even today we all most of our leading teaching institutions do not teach their residents to do whole lab they teach them to do robotics they teach them to do laparoscopy but they don't talk about whole lab and that is because the consultants perhaps themselves need time and in a in a teaching institution there is the the time is uh, very short for the operation theater so they say i can do this you are in 25 minutes why should i spend one hour for on whole lab and that may be justified in the individual institution but the mentoring has to the learning curve has to start as a resident and if you see whole lab day in and day out like our residents see when we are operating when they go out they hardly see any difference they will straight away perhaps they will they will not see the trps as other residents but they can do holep as many as well as we can so a lot depends upon mentoring during your mch or your ms for any the biggest, the biggest obstruction in the way of learning holep is we are unable to convince our students that holep is actually much better than trp and when while when we start doing it we know because i have done whenever a patient asks for a trp sometimes they have a problem and they say okay we can't afford the laser prostatectomy we want a trp i still go ahead and do a, a whole up on them and i do it in the lesser uh, charges because you know a whole up doesn't cost as much as for the expertise as much as for the thing but i think we have unable to convince them clearly that uh, uh, okay the so the best way to convince swapan is that if you talk to my resident they will tell you there are zero post op events after whole app because they don't have to go I and you, I'm a have, so huh. that is yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah, all uh, those uh, and the, the, there is a question for dr vashne that what are yes. the incidence of bladder neck contracture after whole app and how to prevent it yeah i think it's a very nice question and the uh, point is that whatever energy source you use the size and uh, the f- type of prostate has a factor because if you have a very small fibrous prostate you have a potential for a bladder neck contracture as in trp or as in any other modality so the uh, we do take precautions of preventing a bladder neck contracture that we leave a anterior strip of mucosa and here we don't touch at 12 o'clock the enucleation is from 11 down and from 1 o'clock down so a strip of 1 cm is left from uh, apex towards veru and this is strip serves uh, to prevent and at the same time in all small prostates we add a deep incision at 6 o'clock which is uh, right as described for a bladder neck incision and this makes it uh, uh, practically full proof even a small gland Okay, so there is another question. What are contraindications of whole lip in the present era? I think this is a very important question. And when I started whole lip, the list of contraindications was huge, and which is was that the starting from the patient who could cannot be given anesthesia or the patients who were not able to be put put in lithotomy position. or the patients who had sepsis prostatic abscesses tender prostates in fluid infection 
so they were all went into a sort of a contraindication state but as my experience has grown i just want to share with you that i have been able to deal with all these odd situations and even i have done three cases of ankylosing spondylitis with adduction deformity you will be surprised that dr varshne how you did it and uh, this is what my anesthetist have to see so what happens is that when you master an art you are able to do it in those situations which are theoretically contraindicated we have done whole lap in local anesthesia nowadays we have done it as a day care surgery we have done it in adduction deformities and we have done in prosthetic abscesses large abscesses and why, uh, because the theory has to be very understood that if you are on a capsule you are in inucleating whole thing and block so whether it is full of abscesses also you are not touching it so therefore okay, Dr. The, sorry to cut because we are short running short time we got two questions which you have to answer what are your settings for yeah. holep and number two what are the precautions to be taken during the covid crisis when you are doing your holep i think that is the best question uh, the settings as i told you that you are the um, driver and when you drive you have to feel confident with whatever set hello i think sir is uh, communication is out till the time it he rejoins us back dr yeah. tareja sir uh, uh, in your uh, practice uh, do you perform day care holeps and uh, what is no. what it means day care holeps mean are you within 24 hours you are discharging the patient and calling him back for catheter removal or you are removing the catheter and then sending him so it is uh, a very important question that we need to deal with humans as humans it is very important so what would you like to be done suppose you would need it to undergo a whole lap surgery would you like to go home with the catheter the next day or wait for another day and get the catheter removed be there in the ward be in the presence of the treating surgeon's team and the surgeon himself to see if you have dysuria you have bleeding you have pain or something whatever whether it is stress incontinence or urge incontinence so you need to be in the in the presence and care of the surgical team and that is what i believe so normally i remove catheter after 48 hours so if i have operated today i would remove catheter day after tomorrow at 6 o'clock and i'm there at 8 o'clock by then the patient would have voided or would have had whatever problems or would if at all there any problem then otherwise i talk to him sit with him tell him about the post op advice post discharge advice which is usually that have a light activity and uh, you do not uh, strain too much we talk about the sugar levels we talk about the anticoagulant levels we talk about the other things and tell him the and in case there is anything which is disturbing for him in terms of pain or some kind of bleeding we need to reassure the patient so doing a cat whole lap and sending him back is a it is a, is a trend that is seen in in countries where the insurance is paying and the bed charges are overwhelmingly more than the surgical charges which is not true in our condition so i will not like to say that we will do a holep in a day care procedure because I, well, if i am the patient i would not like to be thrown out of the hospital the same yes. evening maybe times will change this thought but this is how i perceive it uh, tanija sir Yes. I have a question. Uh, good yes. evening, sir. So, good evening. Uh, generally, see if the case ends up at five in the evening. I hmm. sometimes discharge patient next day eight in the morning. Hmm. So, if the case has happened eight in the morning, why patient could not be discharged in seven in the evening? You know, see, see, I will tell you the reason. The reason is that when you discharge, if it is done in the morning, you discharge at the six o'clock in the evening. If he has a problem at ten p.m. when he reaches home. then the whole family is disturbed that is the whole thing so staying overnight is not going to make too much of a difference suppose there is you know a simple thing like a, a kink in the catheter or there is a bladder spasm or there is a spasm of the bladder and there is some leakage of urine around the catheter our patients are very sensitive they will give you a call at 6 o'clock that sub leaking ho raha hai ab aap uska kya kariyega so night the problem in night is that everybody gets apprehensive in the night because they feel helpless they think na ab to doctor milega nahi ab kya hoga raat ko so that is a very disturbing thought in indian scenario 
Yes, if you are used to in a community where the patients are used to looking after themselves and they are used to be there without the presence of doctor all around them, in that situation, maybe that is okay. But I would rather keep the patient overnight and send him the next day if that is okay.